Greetings and welcome to Ill Repute, the podcast about women and women first. I am Sovereign Sire, a writer, a comedian, and frankly, over it. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> and I'm Ella Darling, a former librarian, a VR pioneer, an adult film performer here and there, and uh, impulsively emphatically happy to be your good buddy. <laughs> oh. ah. um, now, we here at El Repute support women's rights. But more importantly, we support women's wrongs. So Ella, what women's wrongs are we writing today? Yours, mine, and roughly two to four percent of adult women. ADHD. All right. We're we are gonna have to take a little side tour through some uh some historical misogyny in medicine along the way, but uh we'll get there. ADHD is often stereotyped as a young boy's condition, full of hyperactivity and impulsiveness. But what happens when this gendered misconception is accepted not just amongst the misinformed, but by the general medical community? Where does this leave women? In search of a diagnosis that for far too many arrives too late, if at all, unfortunately. Yeah. Because a lot of women aren't actually diagnosed until adulthood. Yes. And I want to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> We'll explore the murky waters of gender disparities in medical research, how it's historically sidelined women's health issues, and the particular case of ADHD, where so many women find themselves diagnosed in adulthood, if at all. Furthermore, while studies have been devastatingly scarce for women, there are comparably very few primary sources that plumb the depths of ADHD in trans and non-binary people. We included data from primary sources when reliable and available, but this is clearly a ripe area of research that's long overdue. ADHD is a topic that is very personal for me, and I know also for you, Sovereign, yes. um, because if it isn't abundantly clear, uh, we both have ADHD. I was diagnosed as an adult, and I came with all of the impulsive, inattentive bells and whistles that are notable in women with the disorder. So if I speak throughout the podcast, with uh, bold candor about ADHD. Uh, it's coming from a place of vulnerability, experience, and empathy. I live it. I love you if you're also living it. If I talk about like squirrel, it's just a way that me and my other ADHD friends learn to sort of like contextualize things that are troublesome in a way that's more relatable. But I just want to sort of couch things just so you guys know it, we're not speaking from a place of obliviousness. Yeah. We're venturing into a realm, in fact, where science meets societal expectations and where women's health often lurks in the shadows of misunderstanding. So you sat down to write a script about ADHD and you already found another train of thought to get distracted by. It's very appropriate. <laughs> oh, you know, I am I'm nothing if either inconsistently consistent or consistently inconsistent. Yeah. Um, but all right. So let's go over ADHD symptoms in boys and girls. Uh, and also what the fuck it is. So ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder that affects both children and adults. Individuals with ADHD may experience persistent patterns of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity that could interfere with their daily functioning and quality of life. Uh, there are three main presentation subtypes of ADHD. There's inattentive, hyperactive impulsive and combined presentation we're mostly going to be talking about inattentive because that's the most prevalent in women but we're really not going to talk too much about the nuances or we're not going to discern between the three because that's just we're not clinicians you know and uh that's probably best left to the more educated so we're just going to speak about it a little bit more openly and a little bit more broadly so shall we begin yes what are the symptoms symptoms <laughs> i mean i could list off my own but symptoms of eight oh and we we will yeah <laughs> <laughs> and we will. Symptoms of ADHD were defined and adjusted for decades based on observing the disorder in young boys. 
Children with ADHD often struggle with paying attention, organizing tasks, and following through on instructions. They may be forgetful, easily distracted, and prone to making careless mistakes. Additionally, they tend to be hyperactive, aggressive, constantly moving and fidgeting, and talking excessively. Impulsivity can lead them to interrupt others, have difficulty waiting their turn, and act without thinking. I have a YouTube video here. So let's jump into the research. ADHD is the same disorder no matter what gender you are. The same brain regions and neurotransmitter systems are affected and the same core deficits are present. But the resulting symptoms, what people actually see, can show up differently due to the biological difference between males and females as well as the social differences in the experiences of men and women. As a result of gender and sex differences, ADHD leads to different presentations and outcomes. For example, women are often expected to be good at organizing, planning, and other executive functions, and society is generally less forgiving to women when they mess up. We tend to work harder to fit in and be good due to social pressures. Females with ADHD tend to show more inattentiveness than hyperactivity or impulsiveness, and are more likely than males to develop anxiety, self-esteem issues, and other internalizing problems, while males with ADHD tend to develop more externalizing problems, like rule-breaking or aggression, than females do. So what are your thoughts on that video? Um, that falls pretty in line. I, the whole thing about that women are just expected to be organizers and planners. Like I had never really thought about that before Mm -hmm. that. Oh yeah. Like that is generally kind of what women are expected to do. And I can think of in many relationships where, um, that fell on me. And I, I just even think about like in the dating world and women are like, they never plan dates. They never do this or that. And I didn't realize how much the default setting is just that women are just expected to be the ones doing that stuff. And so, yeah, having ADHD, that's can be incredibly difficult. Yeah. And when you think about uh, like uh, the emotional load, which I have on my shelf, so I should know the author's name, but uh, just the the idea of the emotional labor that most women, especially in married and especially in parental relationships, take on just the the lion's share of the managerial tasks of a ho- of a household and end up being the delegators. Yeah. And so they're actually doing most of the work even when it feels and so we're just we're just as a gender sort of expected to be the nurturing, caring, like we're supposed to have it handled. Yeah. And that's something that I fall into really badly. I just like I just assume that this is part of being a the like the group project mindset where it's like when you're the the gifted kid, you just always know that like everyone else is going to fuck off. So I'm just going to have to pull the weight of the whole group project. Yeah. Um, and I think it kind of carries into that, which I think is something that is more common in, in young girls. But I'm, uh, I'm just I'm a bad woman. I don't do any of that shit and I never have. And when people looked at me Good and expected you. me to do it, I just said, no, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not the me. one. I don't know where I got. You keep talking like I don't know where I got the gold plated backbone, but it, it's just like I just have never. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Not doing it. Not going to. So like no, no one ever asks anymore because my whole thing has been like, no. And I just say like, why no. would you? Ask? Like, I don't. It Good for doesn't you. Doesn't sound fun for me. I, I I'm not I won't be good at it like mm-hmm. I'm not the one you want for the job if you want me to come be a keynote speaker I will happily go speak at your event I will go do stand up at your event mm-hmm. I will promote your event <laughs> but will I organize anything for your event no no I will not oh see when it comes to events that's a different story when it comes to business I actually have a backbone I actually am kind of a boss bitch it it comes down to personal relationships. But I mean that like even like, socially and like and whatever. I'm just like, I'm yeah. never going to be yeah. that person. Sorry. Right. Like if that's what you need, like we're not, compatible. you know, like I'm lucky. Oh, like I got a partner that's a planner. Like he he likes doing that shit and he's good at it and he never misses. And then anytime I've tried to organize something, it just completely went to shit. And then we just decided from there on out, like he's the planner. There you go. Yeah. There you, you got You got to so, know your look. limitations and just be like, no. <laughs> Know your strengths, play into your strengths and build your partner into their strengths, especially when they they support the places where you're not strong. That means that's just how you do good partnership. So even though ADHD has been typecast as a young boy's condition, we are here today to dismantle that myth. And it still it still remains. It is still actually kind of pervasive. People are still shocked to find out that women or young girls are diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I 
find so much pushback about my own diagnosis. Oh God, from people who oh, I expect God. better from. And that's just because you're a girl. If you're a girl, and you say you have girl. anything. They're like, no, you don't. It's like the weirdest, it's the or you have hormones or you're on your period. Are you pregnant? Are you sure? It's the weirdest like knee jerk reaction. Like if I say like I'm going to the gym a lot, like I'm trying to like get fit, do whatever, and it's like, well, I mean, but you're not gonna get you you're not gonna though. get it doing cardio. Like like no, like it's it's all diet. It's it's like it's like oh being a God. woman. The way that no matter what you fucking say, like. There has to be push. I have ADD. Like, invites- well, no, like what? See, what you really need to do. It's like about the, the preservatives and the food you're eating. No, yeah. it's, it is what it is. If there can be any takeaway, you're not you're not going to motivate people with your good words into not having ADHD. That's not how it works. But I just and think that's about not what that, therapy like, is either. Like, I just try to think of like. Anytime I've said anything where someone just went like, yeah, OK, like where there wasn't some kind of no mm. you know i have depression yeah. like well you know i mean like but like you like you're fine it's because you having depression means that you now have a source of of need to like be heard be respected be like have your experience acknowledged and that counter that contradicts a lot of people's expectation that you are there to actually reinforce their personal. Yeah, and narrative. that goes into the social role of women, right? Because we're supposed to be the caretakers, mm-hmm. the organizers, the planners, the keepers of the mm-hmm. knowledge, all the stuff, right? So if there, if we have any issue, it's like no, 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 no. I can't accept that there's anything that would make this this task hard for you. Nope. So we're just going to block that out. We're going to negate it. We're going to invalidate it. We're going to get that idea right out of your head. Because like if I acknowledge you have depression or you have autism or you have have ADHD, then that means that when I ask you to like go be the event planner, that like I'm being an asshole. So rather than that, I'm going to deny your Uh reality until you agree with me. Like, yeah. and And that just goes for one with anything. There was a TikTok where the guy was going up to dudes and he was like, can you name any any hobby that a girl can have that won't be made fun of? And every guy just sat there and went, no. No one could think of a single thing, like activity, that a woman enjoys doing that that, that doesn't get made fun of. There was, a, there was an Ask Reddit or maybe, I think it was Ask Reddit thread recently about this girl was talking about how like she loves her boyfriend but he's just so dismissive of, of like all the things she likes, like Taylor Swift, pumpkin spice lattes. Um, I don't remember all of the things, but it was a bunch of things that were very classically like girl culture. Yeah. And, and they were all very disparate. They weren't related. It's not like, well, he hates pumpkins and he hates fancy coffee and he hates consumerism. No, it was just like consistent. It was just like every single thing across a wide spectrum that her boyfriend purportedly hated was stuff that's like he just hates women and he hates you that you are one and he resents you for having interests and hobbies that aren't him and uh yeah exactly that aren't him or that don't support his that he he resents that you're not like why are you wasting time on your own hobbies and interests yeah when i've got all these great ones that you could easily invest yourself in and i've talked at you at length about them how are you not already picking up how great they are right yeah so it's like so this is like a pervasive problem that doesn't even have to do with mental illness. It's just across the board. This is just the female yeah, experience. Yeah, it's just the female experience. Yeah, which bleeds into the female experience is just the sort of underlying foundation. It gives you context for why all of this other shit is where it is. It's not the reason why it's there. It's not that everything is built upon the female experience. The female experience is really the cherry on top. Yeah. It's just like it gives you context for everything. The reality is that ADHD does not discriminate by gender, but women often find themselves on a diagnostic odyssey grappling with symptoms that don't always fit the traditional mold. Both genetic and environmental factors are believed to contribute to its development. The symptoms of ADHD often present in childhood and diagnosis typically occurs during that time. According to the CDC and NHIS, ADHD is diagnosed in about 9.8% of children under the age of 18, with boys diagnosed at a rate of 13.3% compared to 5.6% for girls, and these rates jump up to 15% 
of trans feminine and 16% of trans masculine youth. This disparity doesn't paint the full picture of ADHD's impact across genders. The mean age for diagnosis in adults is around 32.7 years, with no significant sex differences there, uh, or gender differences. But the journey to that point is fraught with challenges. ADHD's many faces often mask the struggles that women face, leading to underdiagnosis and misunderstood symptoms. Not to mention societal pressures and expectations placed on women, which can mask symptoms or make women less likely to seek help. It all adds up to a disorder that frequently hides in plain sight. I um, have a, like, I'm wondering why 32 is the age. No, I have some guesses. I'm not, I have some guesses too, but I would guess that that, you know what? Um, I want to say 35 to 65% of ADHD that was diagnosed in childhood carries on to adulthood. Okay. And I would imagine that of the percentage of adult women who are diagnosed, a lot of them are not diagnosed until their 30s when they have had the opportunity to engage in discourse with other women, when they've maybe had the opportunity to either get married and divorced have kids, have like be on top of their job. Just just in general, when you're in your 30s, you kind of find yourself in a place that's more like on top of your sh like. Oh, see, I just... have a much more bleak theory. <laughs> okay. I would say that when people enter their 30s and they realize that mm -hmm. their life is not where they want it to be, oh. they are far more likely to start to seek help. So, you know, that's like fair. you go through your 20s and it's like, I don't really have my shit together, but like I'm doing whatever. And then I think when you hit 30 and you look around and it's like, man, why is this so easy for everyone else? Like my life is really like not where and like and I'm looking back and I, all I'm seeing is like my failures adding up to like where I'm mm -hmm. at. So my guess would be that 32 as far as like, you know, we all have like a birth co cohort. Right. And like we're mm -hmm. all kind of hitting milestones at approximately the same time. College graduation, right. marriage, kids, homeownership. Right. And like and that's how we kind of judge how we're doing socially. And I would say that like everyone kind of fucks off and is crazy in their 20s. But people with ADHD that have had a lot of negative experiences, they've they've changed a lot of jobs. They've they've held many jobs. They keep getting fired for like making stupid mistakes, that kind of thing. I would say that maybe like reaching into their 30s would be the time that they pull back and start to realize that like their life looks significantly different than their peers. And then they're going like, what is wrong? That, But that's just like, so mine's a little more dark. That sounds like, no, that, that sounds, that your sounds way more accurate. I was just thinking like maybe people start talking to each other about things and take this shit seriously more in their 30s because in your 20s, there's just like a whirlwind of everything. But I'm also, I realize uh, projecting my 20s on the general population. And my 20s was getting married, getting divorced, uh, a whole career of pornography of all different kinds and a whole bunch of other things. So maybe my experience is not what I should be basing my understanding on. So yeah, your sounds, your sounds darker, but more real, which is, you know, also just more real. Hormonal changes and menstruation may aggravate our experiences with ADHD which I found fascinating. And uh, I actually, I have more on this in the comorbidity section, um, but also hormonal birth control can have an impact on your experience with ADHD, your diagnosis, your medication, all of it, or your medication efficacy. So let's, uh, let's pull up ADHD in women. For those of us who menstruate, our ADHD symptoms may change or worsen during certain parts of our menstrual cycle and during certain stages of life, like puberty, pregnancy, post-pregnancy, menopause when we have these big hormonal changes so our adhd presentation and treatment needs may change as well cool okay but my doctor knows all that right probably not the thing there is that it i was shocked to learn that menstruation menopause puberty perimenopause birth control all of these things can vastly impact the way that women experience their adhd and their adhd symptoms which is striking to me because I have had a really hard time with hormonal birth control because it makes me feel like I am not myself. It makes me feel uh, out of touch and it makes me feel like I have a trigger, like a hair trigger response. Like it just, yeah. 
it makes me feel like I'm outside of my body looking in and hating. It's like someone else is controlling yeah. me. Um, and I don't know if that's ADHD or if that's just my weird ass body, but um, I never, I never took the time to consider that. Anyway. Yeah. So girls symptoms tend to manifest more through inattention and distractibility, like difficulty with organization, focus and attention to detail. Whereas boys often display outward aggression, girls symptoms might look like daydreaming, spacing out in conversations, poor time management and forgetfulness. I'm ashamed sometimes of the way that my ADHD is ever present and it's not something that I choose. Yeah. So a lot of the time I will assign my ADHD symptoms to being a stoner, even though I actually don't smoke all that much weed. I mean, subjectively, but I just I recognize this in that like even I distance myself from my own symptoms because I don't embrace them as part of my disorder. Yeah. You know. All right, so this is a short. Let's talk symptoms of ADHD in women. Women with ADHD tend to have lower self-esteem. They're more likely to be daydreamers. They tend to fidget in their chair a lot. They might deal with odd eating habits or binge eating. They're more likely to be labeled as moody or too sensitive. They tend to have difficulty with time management and organization. They tend to be more sensitive to rejection and criticism. And they're more likely to be anxious and have a serious case of imposter syndrome. I thought that was a really good. Yeah, I, I identify down. with all of that. I was um, I have a lot of hyperactivity um, mm -hmm. and I have since I was a little kid. Like my earliest memories are me just trying to get out of my mother's arms like mm -hmm. her sitting in an NA meeting, like speaking and holding me in her lap and me just writhing and twitching and kicking, trying to just like get out. And that like her best friends, like you were always just like so like at 100. I think that might be slightly less common in young women, the actual hyperactivity. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm and, uh, essentially a dude. And all in all in all but in all but in all but presentation. <laughs> I you know, I frequently feel that way about myself. I in fact I don't, but I frequently comment that like I'm so lucky that I'm not a dude because I would have been canceled ten times over. I but I feel like when you're a girl, you can objectify girls just a little yeah. bit for Yes. Hyperactivity might be internally expressed through things like hyperfocus, catastrophizing, impulsive shopping, or overspending, and demeaning self-dialogue. Women with ADHD are frequently highly self-critical while also being high-functioning or workaholics. While these symptoms are less visible, they are equally impactful. In our little bonus content that we recorded earlier, we went over a lot of these things, including being a workaholic as, as a solution to undiagnosed ADHD, which I relate to because yeah. I did that. Yeah. Emotional dysregulation is another big symptom for women. It's common in girls with ADHD, leading to a higher risk of being misdiagnosed. It can also lead to something called rejection sensitive dysphoria or RSD. RSD is the extreme sensitivity to perceived rejection, criticism, or disapproval. It can cause severe emotional pain, and it can really affect someone's self-esteem and their social interactions. Um, it can be devastating. And oh. I think this, oh, is, yeah. this is not unique to ADHD, but it is something that people with ADHD, and especially women and young women with ADHD experience, which is part of why I think a lot of our experiences are couched in shame and we end up internalizing them yeah. instead of seeking help. Yeah. But we've got a little uh, video here. I can't believe you haven't responded to my email yet. It's kind of like you do absolutely nothing all day and I'm pretty sure you're this close to being fired. Hey, just bumping my last email because I know things can get pretty busy. I feel like you made a lot of really stupid mistakes and it kind of pisses me off that I have to go back and correct all of the stuff that you should have done right in the first place. And quite frankly, it's embarrassing that I have to work with someone as dysfunctional as you are. You know what? This looks great. There are a couple of minor edits I want to make, but I'll go ahead and do that and get this back to you. What is your problem lately? You're a mess and you seem so fragile, like you can't handle the tiniest bit of stress lately. Hey, you seem kind of stressed lately. Are you okay? What do you think, like, to what degree are young girls and young women taught to be people-pleasing and personable above their own comfort? And how does that disrupt their access to adequate mental health care? 
this is a little discussion um, point I thought we could explore. I think that it's it's huge. And we talk about this in the bonus episode, but you know, everyone that comes into a doctor's office comes in with like a competing list of kind of like oppressions, conditioning, experiences, fears, expectations, and goals, right? And mm-hmm. absolutely women, I think that most people seek out mental health and maybe i'm wrong and maybe someone one of the listeners can correct me i feel that people tend to seek out mental health help not when they're in pain but when someone outside has said you're you're not being you're being bad at womaning or you're being bad at manning and then Mm -hmm. they it's like So a lot of times I think even when people are seeking help, it's not because like I'm in pain and I would like to alleviate this pain. It's like they're going there because someone has told them that they're at some kind of deficit. So the minute they walk into the the doctor's office, they're already at a disadvantage because they have failed in some way to live up to whatever is expected of them to be a good citizen, a good father, a good husband, a good mother, a good daughter, a good girlfriend, whatever it is. So I think that is like both genders. So that's already that's so all, the discourse that's already there. Then on top of so it's not about how can I feel about how can I feel better. It's how can I fail people less. Yeah, I think that I think I'm that when most that. people are seeking out uh, mental health services, it's because someone else has said that they have a problem, right? Um, well, I will say that the doctor that did eventually diagnose me with ADHD, who again in our bonus content that we recorded. I noted uh, originally I was diagnosed with was something else where I had a Lamictal, which I think is an, a, a light antidepressant. Well, know. it's an antidepressant. I'm not going to say anything is light or heavy. It's a thing. But when I came in, I came in because I had a really emotionally abusive ex-boyfriend who told me that I was the problem, not his aggressive alcoholism, emotional abuse, and controlling behavior. But that I was the problem. But he guided me to a psychiatrist because he told me that he didn't need to go to therapy. I was the problem. And I was like, well, I don't think that's right, but I will do my due diligence just in case. And then that ended up, that doctor ended up telling me that, like, you should break up with this guy because he's abusive yeah. and you don't you're not depressed. You have ADHD, girl. Yeah. And that changed my life. So I actually maybe have him to thank. But just to go back to your point that like we do seek help, not because we think that we need it, because we find ways to manage yes. it because we live this our entire lives. Well, it is our normal. Well, it's also we just like it's just it. like we're a, you're a fish swimming in water like you don't register the water. It just is. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it just is. And so. You don't know that other people aren't kind of struggling with the same shit or that the same like that you just assume like, well, this stuff is hard for everybody. And, you know, my failing is that like I'm just not able to overcome it the way they are. But we Mm -hmm. we start with the base idea that like we're we're everyone is going through the same thing. Our maladaption is that we can't just get over it. And other people seem to be able to just get over it, right? And then when we... Yeah. And when you compare yourself to other people, you don't see their maladaptions or if they're right. handling maladaptions or maybe they just don't have the same But ones. then also, but, yeah, yeah. The, there's an intense amount of pressure put on women socially to be submissive, to be docile, to be the mediators, to be the communicators, to be humble, to be of service, to be likable uh Mm -hmm. amiable like and so yeah i think it is harder for us in a medical setting to advocate for ourselves because we're not taught how to advocate for ourselves i'm super lucky my mom is a NICU nurse and so Mm -hmm. i was very lucky to have that person going to me with every doctor's appointment when i was a kid sitting in the room and going no baby tell him again you know and like and well tell me I'm going to, okay, make sure you write down a list of every single thing and pull out the list and make sure they let you get to every item on the list before they walk out that door. And then right. tell them this is the test you want. You want this test, not whatever. You were incredibly lucky yeah, to have like, that Yeah, like, because she knows. Because she, because in yeah. the healthcare system, because she just knows. 
you know? Yeah. And she's a nurse and she um, still goes through it. She was having, she had this long thing going on for like the longest time. And she was like advocating her fucking ass off going, there's something going on. There's something going on. There's something going on. And like the amount of persistence she had to have. And then finally they take the fucking x-rays and there's a fucking mass in her lung. Luckily, it was a bacterial infection. They were able to treat her with a round of antibiotics. And in two weeks, she was better. For six months, she was like hacking and coughing and like something's wrong, but they're saying it's not. And like she's we're someone that advocates her ass so off. so deep into this. She, yeah. We're going to get so deep into that. Yeah. She uh, advocates her ass off you, and wait. she still gets a sandwich. So like, yeah. 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 Um, this is what I wear when I need to go see my doctor because I have to go to my doctor every three months to maintain my Adderall prescription. And I believe this is a federal mandate. I'm not certain. You're lucky. I, mine at no. every every 30 days every in 30, California. Yeah, mine is in Texas at least. It's uh, every three months. And he can choose at his discretion, I believe, though I think it fluctuates with legality. Um, he can be like, okay, well, you, I saw you in person the last time. We can do a phone. We can do the tele one this time, the, the video one this time. But you do need to come in for the next one because he needs to see me. He needs yeah. to see my affect. He needs to see my my body because I have been underweight when I've visited yeah. him. He needs to do his due diligence as a medical provider, yeah. which I have. I have a I have incredibly great medical care, especially considering that I'm in Texas. I have uh, my the two most important doctors I've dealt with in the past year both know that I'm a sex worker and have been incredibly like overwhelmingly positive about it. Because if I ever give pause to my provider that maybe they shouldn't be prescribing me the things that are the only way that I function, I know that that would me up. The same way that I've talked about how I dreaded breaking an arm for so long yeah. because I knew I wouldn't work out afterwards and then it proved true. The same is true if, if I lapse too long on my medication, I'm gonna be thrown full full force back into my symptoms and I can't function like in a in my best days I could function I guess but right now given that I'm in a place in my life where I'm really holding on by a thread if I didn't have my medication I don't know I don't know where I'd be I would yeah I might be fucking homeless I just I wouldn't have any executive function yeah. so part of ADHD is also performing wellness yes so that you can maintain the it, that works for you even when you're in a uh, sort of rough period. Yes. So the diagnostic journey for women with ADHD is fraught with challenges exacerbated by societal pressures, lack of awareness, gender biases ingrained in healthcare systems, and misconceptions surrounding femininity and neurodevelopmental disorders. The traditional portrayal of women as organized, nurturing, and attentive may lead to the misinterpretation or dismissal of ADHD symptoms that deviate from these norms. Consequently, behaviors associated with ADHD, like impulsivity and disorganization, may be wrongly attributed to personality traits, or worse, labeled as drug-seeking behavior. And this is one of the big things that I think impacts young women, and especially adult women, actually adult women more than anyone, about seeking treatment, and this is something that prohibited me from seeking treatment, was that I was worried that I would seem like I was seeking drugs. I kind of started suspecting or figured out that I had uh, ADHD in medical school. And at that time, I, because of stigma, I didn't seek out diagnosis because I figured that people would think I was just trying to get on stimulants to get through medical school easier. As more women like Sarah Fuller are diagnosed with ADHD in adulthood, that gap between its prevalence across gender closes. The way that health insurance and uh, diagnosis and, and doctor referrals work state to state is actually much more complicated than people realize because we're used to living in a country that's just like sort of every, like your driver's license is valid in this state and every state, but your prescriptions are not. Right. If you are prescribed Adderall, for example, that's a schedule one medication. You can't even shift it from your local Walgreens to your local CVS without a confirmation from your doctor. 
if you're out of state and you forgot your meds at home, you're fucked. Yeah. You literally cannot get those same meds prescribed or, or provided to you in a different state the way that you can almost every other medication. Yeah. Which is something that I learned the hard way. Yeah. In children, teachers are essentially the, the first line of defense against ADHD. Teachers are typically the ones who say, hey, this kid I think has ADHD. You need to get them checked out yeah. to the parents, to whomever. And so teachers are not clinicians. Right. But teachers can only do the best job that they can. Right. And if teachers subscribe to the idea that ADHD is just, it's a boy's thing, then they're never going to recommend that young girls get checked for it. Uh, we, we display things differently. We experience our symptoms differently. And so if a teacher who's already got a million things going on because they're teaching elementary school yeah. is the one who's supposed to be spotting this, we can see how there's already a deficit in the like pre-diagnostic system. Yeah. Lack of awareness about the diverse ways ADHD can manifest in girls further complicates the diagnostic process. Parents and teachers who are often the primary identifiers of potential ADHD in children may overlook or misunderstand symptoms in girls. Unlike boys whose symptoms may manifest as disruptive behaviors, girls' internal struggles with focus and organization may not be as readily apparent, leading to further delays in recognition and intervention. This next clip is from ADHD in Girls from Jessica McCabe's channel, How to ADHD. Boys are diagnosed with ADHD three to four times as often as girls are, even though research is starting to show that girls are just as likely to have it. In fact, some experts believe that boys are being overdiagnosed, while girls tend to be underdiagnosed. Why is that? The simple answer? It's complicated. I did a ton of research on the issue and I found five main reasons for this. One, stereotypes. Boys tend to have the hyperactivity form of ADHD, which is what we tend to think of when we think of ADHD. Since most research, literature, pop culture focuses primarily on how ADHD expresses itself in males, most people are more familiar with what ADHD looks like in males. The less girls fit into that stereotype, the less likely it is that they'll be recognized and diagnosed. Two, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Boys with ADHD tend to cause more trouble, so parents and teachers are more likely to look for a solution. Girls tend to have the inattentive form of ADHD. On progress reports, they're the well-behaved, bright students that just need to try harder. How to ADHD is a really excellent channel um, if you're learning about ADHD, and Jessica McCabe is one of the foremost speakers and and. I don't want to say scholars or influencers, neither seems appropriate, but she's a great person to look into. She's got great insight and she did a really great TEDx talk, which I don't think I ended up linking to, but she is uh, she's a really great advocate. Okay. So. The diagnostic criteria, however, remains the same across genders. So why do we spot it in boys so much more frequently and earlier in life than women who are frequently diagnosed in adulthood? Well, it's probably patriarchy. <laughs> well, that's not shocking. Let's let's get a little more specific. So this brings uh, us to uh, well, our next section, which is <laughs> medicines, misogynistic history, and present. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's not in the rearview mirror. It's right in front yeah, of you, too. Yeah. This show would be so much easier and shorter if patriarchy was just a complete sentence. And I feel like frequently it is, but not enough. So the long answer here is the roots of this issue lie really deep in the soil of medical history. and. What it comes down to is the ongoing gender disparity and bias in medical research, which has had an enduring impact on women's health, diagnostic criteria, and treatment modalities across all diagnoses, but certainly also with regards to ADHD. But this is something that is a much bigger issue that I came, oh, a, a dick hair's breadth <laughs> from just splitting into two episodes before I realized that I wasn't going to do that topic justice. So that will be a topic down the okay. line, just specifically how medical research has an ongoing effect on women's health and has been unjust to women. Are you, fa are you familiar with Dr. Cameron from Canada? Not off the top of my head. That, that, that's, a, that's one we're going to... Dr. Cameron was a male doctor that was using young women as a psychological experiment and completely destroyed the, the minds of like hundreds of women by erasing their memories, uh, subjecting them to intense deprivational traumas, et cetera, et cetera. And he exclusively, so an adult he man exclusively kind of found a way exclusively to... targeted, you know, young women. Anyway, what, like that will be a great one to dovetail into 
uh, that will be part of yeah. that greater discussion. I'll, I'll, I'll send, I, I'll send I, you a link. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The, the more I, the more I delved into ADHD, the more I realized that I really like, we can't discuss ADHD in women without completely acknowledging, um, that impact, yeah. the, the impact of medical research disparity, which we're actually going to dive into a little bit more later. For centuries, medical research has been androcentric, focusing primarily on male subjects. This bias has had a profound impact on understanding and treating conditions that are relevant to women. For example, the historic exclusion of women from clinical studies due to concerns over fertility or the erroneous belief that men's health could be universally represented. For example, the historical exclusion of women from clinical studies due to concerns over fertility, or the false belief that men's health could just universally represent human health, like women, and this is a, a quote from a research study, women are just small men. That skewed data and, and treatment approaches significantly. Yeah. It's a tale as old as time, where women's health concerns are sidelined, misdiagnosed, or dismissed outright. In Sex Inequalities in Medical Research, a systematic scoping review of the literature, the authors note, quote, androcentricity in medical research has historically disadvantaged and damaged female patients. From inaccurate diagnosis of hysteria and related barbaric treatments such as clitoridectomies and extended periods of enforced bed rest, the hysterical discourse is often used colloquially with terms such as mad and crazy used to describe difficult women who do not respond to treatment or diagnosis as expected, unquote. From hysteria to heart disease, the bias in medical research and diagnoses has left women fighting for visibility and validation in a system built around male norms. Endometriosis, is a great example of this. The lag time from onset to diagnosis for women with endo, while it varies by country, it can be between like seven and 12 years before the disease is identified. That's a long time to have endometriosis yeah. and not have it treated. Yeah. That lapse time in diagnosis leads to unnecessary, painful, dangerous complications, and in some cases, unnecessary, painful, dangerous procedures. Yeah. I mean, this is um, kind of one of the times where um, historians may have had it right. So most people have heard of like the wandering womb and this belief, they used to believe that like the uterus could like travel around the body and cause like hysteria. Mm -hmm. And what I believe is that they because they were performing autopsies and things like that is that um the wandering womb is real it's called endometriosis they've opened up women and mm -hmm. found endometrial tissue on their lungs on their heart on their liver on their kidneys like they have found endometrial tissue riddled throughout women's bodies women that often had chronic pain and issues that they kept coming to their doctor for treatment for were misdiagnosed with. And then when they died during the autopsy, there was a case where, I mean, this woman's tissues from like head to foot were covered in endometrial tissue, which for, if you don't know, that's your uterine tissue, right? So um, yeah, like, and that, and that's just an example of like, oh no, like that's, that's whatever. And it's like, they were actually kind of onto something. And that, like, I imagine these women did seem hysterical because if you had endometrial tissue on your fucking lungs, you're probably pretty fucking distressed. For sure. So, Safi, have you ever heard of the phrase the Yentl syndrome? Or do you know the film Yentl? I do not. I'm a bad gay. I'm a bad gay. It was coined by Dr. Bernadine Healy in 1991. And it draws a parallel with the eponymous or titular character from Barbara Streisand's 1983 film. Basically, in the film, she has to take on a male identity to seek education and be granted the privileges of, of other people that are men yes. our age. This term encapsulates the pervasive gender bias in healthcare, 
where women are often required to demonstrate symptoms comparable to their male counterparts to receive adequate attention and treatment. And just as an aside, the case study that uh, Dr. Healy coined this from was a woman came in. She reported feeling some symptoms, but she didn't have anything that they could really diagnose, so they discharged her. She came back a few days later. When she came back, we admitted her, and we discovered that she actually did have uh, a serious uh, problem like with her heart. Like a cardiac event. And uh, we dismissed her because her symptoms did not match what we expected. And what we expected was symptoms in men. And the whole point of Dr. Healy's paper was that we cannot, like, women will die if we don't change diagnostic criteria to reflect women's symptoms and experiences. Yeah. And women do, women have, women continue to die because medical research historically prioritizes male participants over female participants. Yeah. And that's not even getting into the gender. Well, yeah. Body. So we did an episode uh, on the Trotula, which was the first medical manual that was ever written. It was written by a woman. Um, and in that episode, we get into like that women were seen as simply inverted males. Our, it's, the right. only difference is that our gonads are on the inside. Like, ah, that's it. Yeah. Like, like otherwise, otherwise, totally the same. Right. Like, and they even had that parallel, like, okay, yeah, well, like the ovaries are the testicles and the, the cervix is the shaft of the penis and the clitoris is the head of the penis. And like, like literally they're just inverted males. Like that was, I mean, but that was, that was just the way it was like, it's like, and and it's kind of like patriarchy can't make up its mind. Are women and men yeah, the same? That's what I'm saying. Are, are they are they exactly. are they completely functionally different? Like which one is it? So the Yentl syndrome mm. underscores a long-standing issue rooted in historical gender disparities. Despite legislative efforts such as the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993 mandating the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical research, challenges persist. However, the act stipulates that both women and men should participate in clinical trials based on the prevalence of sex in the disease. Well, that's pretty fucking circular. Yeah, right? Thank you. <laughs> that makes no fucking sense. If there isn't pre-existing data or clinical understanding of prevalence of a condition in a population, then they're less likely to be selected to participate in future research. Obviously, the circular nature of this dilemma becomes evident when considering the reliance on skewed data for inclusion criteria. So like, if we're going to include someone, if we're going to assume someone might have this issue, then we need the data to tell us they might. And if the data is specifically pulling from people who like, we only decide to test because we think they might, then it's all, it's a shit show. Consequently, the intended goal of improving research inclusivity and generating comprehensive findings remains elusive. Recognizing and rectifying antiquated gender biases within medical research is paramount. Only then can we facilitate genuine progress towards equitable healthcare outcomes. But in the interim, the problem is that we are still seeing a, a, a circular issue where women are consistently excluded from research studies. And we're seeing this even worse now that we have, as a society, an accepted understanding of non-binary people and trans-identified people. And part of the reason why this whole episode is so adherent to a gender binary is because women were only just brought in and the whole medical community is very reluctant to acknowledge anything that counters their existing understanding and research data. And so trans and non-binary people pose a, a concern for that. Yeah. ADHD, like many health concerns, has been historically understudied in women, which has perpetuated misconception about the disorder's gender prevalence. It wasn't until 1997 that the first comprehensive meta-analysis on gender disparities in ADHD was published, 
marking a significant shift in research. Drawing insights from the paper, Cohort Change in the Prevalence of ADHD Amongst U.S. Adults, Evidence of a Gender-Specific Historical Period Effect. That's a whole paper or yeah. title. We trace the evolution of ADHD diagnosis through history. Here are some dates that are relevant to the emergence of our understanding of ADHD over time. So <gasps> the conceptualization of ADHD dates back to 1798 with early observations of symptomology in children. 1937 marks the discovery of the effect of amphetamine on children's behavior and learning problems. But well, amphetamine wasn't isolated until I believe is either 1924 or 1926. So it's, it's a natural chemical that your body produces. So then mm -hmm. you have lab. I got to say it like, like Dr. Frankenfurter. Um, see what's on the slab. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so... Doctor. And I don't know how I know that off the top of my fucking head, but I do. So, um, ADHD, baby. Uh, so then began studies on what it was. Like, what is this? What does it do? What does a lot of it do? What does none of it do? Um, that is what began kind of the process. And so, yeah, it would say it's looking like maybe 15 years later, they got to kids. They had enough of an understanding of what it was doing to safely, uh, use it with children um but it was known i mean hitler was a big met like met like when amphetamine came on the scene like who i know boy. that it was, it was super big amongst it the was Nazis. but it was big, it was super the the two people it's going to be tested on are soldiers in the military and then women that want to lose weight it was a huge mm -hmm. thing in hollywood um because the chic thing for like flappers to look like was that was the first time that being like really skinny um was right. in style Right, right, right. Amphetamine was basically being tested on human beings. Like as soon as they found oh, out I these properties, it. it's like, let's dope up all the boys and then let's dope uh -huh. up all the actresses. Like we don't know, shit, but we, you know, and it makes them skinny and pretty. Yeah, and I think it was like in the 60s or 70s is when there started to be um, sort of a crackdown on it and a recognition that it, it led to other problems. And then I don't know exactly when meth came on the scene, but meth basically metabolizes the amphetamine before it hits your system. So like the means <clears throat> of the means of, of metabolization or whatever you want to call it is much faster. Uh, in 1980, they amended it in the DSM-3, the next one, to attention deficit disorder which a lot of people are familiar with. And a lot of people, even to this day, conflate ADD and ADHD, which are actually, they describe the same condition. It's just a difference in, in how we talk yeah. about it. Um, and then finally, uh, in 2000, they landed on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. And then I, I just had to include... In 2013, the DSM-5 uh, shifted the onset from seven years old to 12 years yeah. old. From all of the research that I've read, that helped decrease false positives in diagnoses. Yeah. But it also helped include girls a little bit more yeah. because if symptoms are still present at that age. And also it acknowledged that like when you're like a little kid, hyperactive because you're a little kid yeah. and that's developmentally appropriate so they updated it as they continued to yeah do, to i feel like they need things, to i feel like school uh, rock needs to make just how they had that thing like how a bill becomes a law <clears throat> talking yeah. about a bill and it's like what people need to understand is that the progress of a diagnosis in the dsmv i mean that they describe so many things as clusters right because a, a lot of times like a cluster B, that's narcissism, histrionic personality disorder, antisocial disorder, um, uh, uh, schizoaffective disorder. As something is yeah. becoming an official diagnosis in the DSMV, what people need to understand is like this process can take 20 to 30 years to really refine what's going on. In terms of medicine, psychology is very young in, in what it's due. Yeah. And you know what? The jury is still out on whether or not it's even real. I can pull up for you on TikTok tons of therapists talking about the crisis that they have 
like 10, 15, 20 years into doing therapy and going, you know, there's a part of me that just understands that all of this is bullshit. Look, I <laughs> so, I really I fight against any dialogue about that because since I was 16, I believed in this and I needed like the tooth fairy. To be I real. get it. I mean, I was a psychology major at first, but I switched to sociology when I found out that none of it was real. And I was like, I was like, yeah, oh, I would prefer I, to study the way people actually behave. And so I switched over to sociology. I switched to library science. Like I switched over to sociology because it just yeah. felt more like I was like, I was like, I don't want to study theory. Like I want to study like what do people actually do? Right. Like how, how do they actually behave? Right. And sociology seemed more about we're going to focus on like the actual behavior that's presenting itself and not worry so much about like what it means, like or where it comes from. We're just going to talk about like what it's doing. Right. Reflecting on historical studies, the prevailing narrative depicted hyperactivity as predominantly male centric. This perspective led to the hypothesis in 1977 that hyperactivity might be an extreme manifestation of socially accepted male behavior. This notion gained further traction in a 1985 study on boys and girls with ADD at the time, which confirmed higher prevalence rates of hyperactive behaviors in boys. This emphasis on hyperactivity in diagnostic criteria resulted in the underdiagnosis of ADHD amongst girls, highlighting a quote unquote silent minority whose symptoms were overlooked. And now I just want to draw attention to the fact that this was something that was attended to and examined in the 70s and 80s by niche ish, perhaps professionals in the field who are still cited today in uh, documentation. So this was not something that people were unaware of. It was just really uh, the professionals at the time who were recognizing it were simply not backed. As far as I can tell, this is me shooting from the hip. Uh, I have to assume that they just they had these ideas, but they just didn't have the backing to actually pursue the research on them. Well, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head right there, which is funding and funding is largely dictated by what the market wants, what it needs. So right. people right. weren't complaining about little girls because their their struggles were internal. They were invisible, but they were concerned mm -hmm. about little boys and, and their behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think what a big shift that happened in the 60s, 70s and 80s was people started talking about domestic violence. They started talking about child sexual abuse. They started talking about child abuse in general. There's, there's, there was suddenly a lot more focus on the family. I, I, I know the, the dreaded phrase, but there, there was more, <sighs> there was more of a fascination with the family. And that was when you first started to get people talking about um, things like birth order and family dysfunction and family dynamics. There, there was, the, it was when they were starting to recognize that what happened to children in their developmental stages and within their families of origin, like impacted behavior, which meant there was just increased scrutiny on what the fuck kids were doing. And so what when they started to look at what kids were doing, what was presenting a problem was like, oh, there's like all these young boys that are like really aggressive in the classroom and really disruptive and da 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 da. And like, Whereas in the past, yeah. it was like, well, yeah, like every class has like a class clown or like the, the, the problem child. And it was just accepted that like some kids are just like that. And then in the 70s, they were yeah. like, are they? Or is like something else going on here? So this brings us to executive dysfunction, which is the largest symptom of ADHD, like 100 percent. So what yeah. what is it? So let's delve into executive dysfunction a core aspect of ADHD in adults that often goes under-recognized. Executive dysfunction refers to difficulties in cognitive processes responsible for goal-directed behavior. These are things like organization, planning, and impulse control. Executive dysfunction can manifest in various ways in the daily lives of adult women with ADHD. For instance, keeping track of appointments and deadlines can feel like an insurmountable task. Many of us struggle with maintaining focus on tasks, leading to unfinished projects and a sense of frustration. But it's not just about forgetfulness or procrastination. Executive dysfunction affects our ability to initiate tasks, 
prioritize and manage time effectively, which if I sound a kind of way, it's because I feel very caught <laughs> right now because that's entirely my it, yeah. Simple tasks like paying bills or replying to text messages or finishing a podcast script on time can become overwhelming hurdles. It's like having a mental fog that clouds our ability to think clearly and make decisions. For some of us, it feels like we're constantly juggling multiple thoughts and responsibilities without a clear sense of direction. Oh, yeah. Which is, Whoa, Nelly. <laughs> that's how I feel a lot of the time and I just want to take a quick aside to say that that's how I feel a lot of the time since my ADHD has become deregulated yeah and so if that's how you feel you don't have to feel that way I don't have to feel that way I'm working on it through a variety of solutions for myself this is something that you experience like you don't always have to feel like you have the right solution in your pocket. You don't need you don't need to feel like you're constantly struggling to have like the right you It's okay to just be where you're at. Yeah. And it's okay to be fine with where you're at. And it's okay to let people know where you're at. You don't have to apologize for yourself. Anything. There's a great podcast called Struggle Care. Um the host is named Casey. She's a licensed therapist uh that has ADHD. And she recently wrote a book called How to Keep House When You're Drowning. And um, she calls her, her TikTok account is Domestic Blisters. <laughs> um, but she, uh, she talks a lot about that, about how to keep house while you're drowning, where she kind of tries to destigmatize the shame that people feel when, because when people are like, oh, you seem really organized, or you seem like you'd be a neat person. And I'm always like, it really depends on the day. Because some days you walk into my place like that shit looks like on fucking point. And sometimes it'll be a week where I've got dishes everywhere, clothes in piles, and there's yeah. so much shame around that. And she does a lot to to de destigmatize yeah. that and and with very much that same message, which is like no one's keeping score. Like 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 each day is a success yeah like if you're like the goal is to manage your stress not to manage other people's expectations i and fyi guys we did a episode of bonus content that is going to go alongside this and we actually delve into what we personally do to help manage our symptoms it's patreon.com forward slash ill repute five bucks a month you get at least one bonus episode per month sometimes more i think this month in february you'll be getting two i think you'll be getting uh, us doing the proust questionnaire and then you'll be getting us really delving and diving into adhd and our personal experience with it as a person who does have adhd it's so much easier for me and for people like me to believe like wow i shouldn't feel this way I need to try harder, sleep less, be more charismatic, eat less, berate myself for every shortcoming along the way. Treatment, help, assistance. What do I look like? Some kind of weak ass bitch. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, the f do I look like a see to you? But I've also been in a place where it's like, oh, my God, I would love to be in a place where I could approach someone to actually ask for help women who have had their real experiences dismissed by doctors who tell them well and just how much we norm we, and how much we just normalize female <clears throat> suffering it's like our moms our friends our cousins our yeah. neighbors like we grow up watching women suffer and we come to feel that like suffering is just part of being a woman like, it's just what you do. Like, of course, you're never sad. Like, if you're lucky, you get to be satisfied. If you're lucky, you get to like, but so much of, of it is like, well, I mean, that's just the way it is, kid. You know, and so we kind yeah, of internalize this sort of like just can white knuckle it, you know, like, because that was kind of the only coping strategy a lot of our parents and grandparents had. You know, there wasn't a lot they yeah, could really what do. Were they gonna yeah. Do? You know, and so. Um. Addressing ADHD in women forces us to confront the 
intertwined comorbid conditions like anxiety and depression, which are very frequent with people who have ADHD. These conditions don't just coexist, they complicate and synergize with the entire diagnosis and treatment landscape for ADHD. Yeah. And this is why this is like the biggest problem with medicine as it is right now and the churn of patients mm -hmm. is like I in the bonus episode, I, I delve into why a lot of people with um, ADHD also have trauma uh, around their childhoods that's associated with how people treat them because of the, because of this disorder. Yeah. But yeah, you know, you can come in and present right with anxiety and depression. And if the doctor doesn't sit with you and really talk with you about like a range of things and they don't know where that anxiety or depression is coming from, if you are constantly missing appointments, if you are constantly rushing at the last minute, if you are constantly forgetting birthdays and things like that, like you're going to have anxiety. You're going to have depression <clears throat> because if, if you can't yeah. complete tasks and everyone else seems to be able to do it, but you can't like... So in those cases, the anxiety and the depression are symptoms of the underlying illness, which is the ADHD. So you can treat the depression and the anxiety, but as long as like, the root cause of it has not been addressed, that it's you're going to it's going to persist. Right. And so yeah. that's you're going to see someone like had... five different antidepressants trying to get the one that works and clears their brain fog. Like and, mm. and I think some of that comes from um, the benefit of having people who are in your social system who are also diagnosed who share with you their diagnostic experiences and their clinical experiences and their experiences with medication can really help you sort of first of all just decide that you need to see someone yeah. and be diagnosed yeah. but if you've already been diagnosed like i have been diagnosed and i have a lot of diagnostic criteria and i'm medicated i still sometimes still like I know that I fall within certain diagnostic criteria and I still sometimes I'm like okay but like is that actually because of my ADHD or am I oh, just that actually is so a giant piece of that shit? That is so common. I think I might just be a big piece of shit. I don't maybe I don't actually have ADHD. Maybe I just feel everybody who trusts me and I suck across the board unilaterally and I'm a failure because yep. mm -hmm. I've done the math personally in my own head and it does seem like that checks out. Yeah. You got to get out of your and head. Is that is a shitty neighborhood. <laughs> the shitty math you do to hurt yourself and your own brain, the shitty ways that you hurt your own, your own feelings. That's not, that's not diagnostic. That's not clinical. That's you being mean to yourself and you deserve better. And even if you don't know how to do that, just like stop. I think the imposter syndrome, too, is there. You know, I think a lot of people that get these diagnoses are like it like, is this really a problem for me? Or is it like I just it's just easier to take Adderall to get things done. <clears throat> and the, the diagnostic, yeah. I'll give you the diagnostic criteria for that. If you're doing it when you're alone, you are not alone. Like. If you are alone and you are unable to focus on tasks, you find yourself in, in weird like OCD, just like thought loops that you can't get out of. Uh, if you're doing that, like when you're by yourself, guess what? You're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've got it. Welcome. Welcome. It's like it's, you know because of everything we've been describing, it, it creates a sense of low self-esteem, which then puts you in, makes you vulnerable to, you know, toxic interactions and connections with people that uh, are attracted to our vulnerability. You know, not that they, and they may not even necessarily realize it, but like, that's what, you know what I mean? Like, that's where, what they're attracted to. The prevalence of psychiatric disorders, such as anxiety, depression, and just general personality disorders is significantly higher in individuals with ADHD, particularly in women. All our struggles might not be as obviously problematic in the short term. Maybe we're doing well in school. Maybe we're not getting in trouble a lot. The long-term issues women with ADHD face are significant, like self-medicating, which can lead to addiction, or eating disorders, STIs or unplanned pregnancies. Chronic pain is common in women with ADHD. Self-harm, 
even attempts at suicide. The longer we go without getting the support we need, the longer we have to figure out how to cope on our own. And those coping mechanisms aren't always gonna be healthy. And the longer we go without understanding why we're struggling, the more dysfunctional beliefs we develop about ourselves and our abilities. Often by the time our struggles are obviously problematic to others, our core beliefs about ourselves have already formed. Oppositional defiant disorder is a frequent comorbid condition affecting up to 84% of children and adolescents with ADHD. This statistic underlines the complexity of ADHD and the necessity for comprehensive, individualized treatment plans. Gender differences in ADHD comorbidities are stark, with women showing stronger associations with a range of psychiatric disorders. This disparity underscores the urgency for tailored approaches in treatment and prevention for women with ADHD, addressing their unique challenges Depression presents another layer of complexity. Women with ADHD who use oral combined birth control are at a significantly higher risk of depression, up to six times more than women without ADHD. It shows that ADHD intersects with other health decisions and outcomes. And we have a video here. I'm a doctor who treats a lot of ADHD and I also happen to have ADHD myself. So it's something we talk about here a lot. People with ADHD tend to have lower self-esteem, especially those of us who identify as women. So I want to talk to you about some of the reasons that women with ADHD tell me that they feel like failures, that they feel like they're not good enough, that they feel like they will never measure up. Because if this is stuff that you struggle with, I want you to know that you're not alone. You're not actually a failure. Your brain is just a little bit different and that's okay. Number one, they tend to beat themselves up for being messy or disorganized, especially moms with ADHD. Number two, they might feel like failures because they don't fit in well with other people. They often wish that they had more friends, but feel like they struggle to make them. And number three, they often feel like failures because they get stressed out by sensory stimulation or interruption, and they feel like they don't control their emotions as well as the average person. The risk extends to the most severe outcomes, including suicide attempts and completions. ADHD elevates these risks, especially in the presence of comorbid disorders, which differ significantly between genders, highlighting the need for nuanced gender-specific support and intervention strategies. In conclusion, in conclusion, the historical diagnostic challenges women face with ADHD have been overbearing, but change is on the horizon. With more awareness and advocacy, the narrative is shifting. Women are finding their voice, challenging the status quo, and pushing for a healthcare system that sees and supports them. And it's about time. Because recognizing ADHD in women isn't just about addressing symptoms. It's about acknowledging our experiences, our struggles, and our honest-to-God resilience. So if this has been demoralizing or anything else, I just want to send the message to every woman who is navigating the complexities of ADHD. I want you to know this. Your story matters, your voice matters, you're not alone. And together, we are rewriting the script on women's health one step at a time, one research study at a time, one National Institute of Health decree at a time. It's slow going, but we're getting there. And if you're not in the gender binary, Oh, darling, we, I, I, I hope we're getting there as best we can, as quick as we can. We're going to do some magic right now. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to take you through okay. some magic. First of all, okay. First of all, credits script by Ella mother darling. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Hosted by Ella mother darling and sovereign mother sire. You are also welcome. Produced by Joshua mother Anderson. You're goddamn welcome. All right, now that we got that out of the way, we have a Patreon, patreon.com forward slash ill repute. On there for $5 a month, you get show notes, you get the uncensored video version of the podcast, and you get bonus episodes every muff month. Uh, you can treat it like a tip jar as we get our workflow figured out because these are obviously, uh, we do a lot of research and a lot to bring this podcast to you. As that 
process is streamlined, we will build out more tiers where you get more stuff. We could start doing live, we could start doing watch things together, and that's all stuff we're talking about and definitely want to get to, and it's on the horizon, so just, just sit tight, it's on its way. We also have a Discord on its way, so you can chat with other people that listen to the show, you can chat with us, and just be part of the Cool Kids Club. And yeah, that is our business, but I wanna take Ella out with what has been my favorite song for the last month. And once you hear this, you're not gonna unhear it. So I want you to go ahead and watch this video with me at the same time. We need to turn that frown upside down. Okay. Top a, there's a, I think there's an actual, that. this is just like the thing. I, there's an actual video for it. And she um, uses her own grandmother. And it's her and her grandmother in a kitchen. Oh. And it's fucking awesome. And yeah. it's like so viral all over TikTok. It's so good. Her name is Thought Squad. She's fucking awesome oh. and weird and nerdy. Like, she's got like a Rick and Morty t-shirt on in like one of the videos. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Fun. Yeah. She's a yeah. Girl. So yeah. I wanted Fuck to it. I wanted to end it on a high note. So that was for you. And we did it. We We did, did it. it. I get I get a lot of DMs. If you go on the ill repute um, Instagram account and go look in there, there's a DM. I get a oh. lot on my personal account because I, I repost a lot of the content from from one account to the other. But um, I yeah. got we got like a like a paragraph. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna read you. And this is in response to the suicide. I have so many thoughts on this recent episode. As a psychiatric nurse, I live with th these people. I just found out last week that my psychiatric unit is being closed. I am in a union, so I have another job, but this job and the resources for this population is essentially being eliminated. Psychiatric illness is one of the most underserved population in our country, and I have no doubt more lives in my community will be lost. Thank you for highlighting the complexities, especially among women, in this difficult topic. May these voices not be silenced. Also, I've seen your postings concerning losses in your own life, and you've highlighted some of your own struggles with PTSD, ADHD, and BPD in your mom. Thank you for giving voice to so many. As you highlight your struggles, it can give others the courage to not hide their own, lessening the stigma that keeps people locked in their perceived or real isolations. I respect it out of you. Keep at it. We need you and your voices, both of you! Exclamation point. We get stuff like that all the time. Fuck. Uh, yep. Thank you. Yeah. So what we do matters here. It's like what we're doing here matters. Um, in the brief time that we've been doing this, it's going on about five months. Um, there are like three or four women that are consistently in my DMs and they're all like so passionate and strong and like not famous, like clout people, like just real fucking women, real, real fucking women. Um, and they love this show and it has made me so happy mm. to know that the show is reaching the audience that I wanted it to and that they get it and that yeah. they love it. Like they yes. get it. They get what we're doing yes. and that this is like, this is not your mom's history show. This is not your mom's fucking feminism class, right? Like they get what we're doing yeah. and they're, it's making them feel proud of who they are. And, you know, and yeah. like that's so this like I did say it's just a podcast, but it's not just a podcast. But like, so, but, also, but um, I want you to know that, like, you are a part of this. Like, so that is for you. Yeah. I have a friend named Priya who's like from day one has just been giving us like really strong, really excellent feedback. And I have a lot of people in my life. I just want to take this moment, I suppose, to acknowledge that there are a lot of people who do a lot of work. Yeah, I think that everyone understands but, and uh, I try to stay on top <clears throat> of shit as much as possible so that uh, because like, I, you know, honestly, after 10 years of being online, I was really afraid to go in the comments or open the emails and they've all been so lovely and it's been it's made it so much yeah, easier and, for me to not be afraid to look at the comments because they're like I, everyone's been awesome. All right, baby. So. Yeah. Have fun with All your right, boyfriend. Darling, I, I love, love you. you too.